Welcome to John Redmond, Power of Attorney, the show that aims to empower you through knowledge of the law. I'm attorney John Redmond. Over the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about the most important legal documents that all adults should have to protect their legal rights and those of their families. Specifically, today we're going to be talking about living wills. What are they, what do they do, and why are they important? And next week we'll be discussing other important legal documents and the importance of maintaining and keeping them safe such as mortgage and insurance information, property titles, court orders regarding important matters like child custody, and so much more. We're going to visit with attorney Rose Scher, who practices in the area of estate planning law. Stay tuned, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the show. Most people have heard the term living will, but there is a lot of confusion about what it actually means. And statistics show that a majority of Americans do not have a living will. Joining us now on the show is attorney Rose Scher, who's going to be talking to us about the importance of living wills. Ms. Scher is an attorney with the Sessions Law Firm in New Orleans, where she practices in the areas of estate planning and estate administration. Thank you for joining us, Rose. Thank you so much for having me here, John. It's a fascinating topic and one that I think a lot of our viewers will be interested to learn a lot more about. So let's start with uh, you telling our viewers, what is a living will and why should people be interested in having one? Sure. So a living will is really known colloquially as the pull the plug document, but um, it's actually a document where you declare whether you want to be withheld from life-sustaining medical intervention. Um, so what you need to do to have that document be a legal document is you need to sign it before two witnesses and you select whether you want nutrition and hydration or whether you don't want nutrition and hydration. Okay, so just in front of two witnesses or do you need a notary or you can do it both ways. Well, mean? the great thing about the living will is that it doesn't need to be signed before notary public, but the two witnesses can't be related to you by blood or marriage, and they also can't be anyone who would inherit from the person who's signing the living will under that person's own will. Okay. So just to make sure we're keeping up, and I'm keeping up. Um, Typically, this applies not only to the person who's lived to the ripe old age of 90 or 100 or 80 years old. Um, this applies to the person who maybe has been in a terrible car accident or they have some illness that um, afflicted them maybe when they're too young. They could be some, at any point in your life, Lord knows when, when, when your time, your ticket is uh, called. Um, a living will is a document that, uh, that at the Sessions firm, uh, it's recommended people have this so your wishes can be honored. Exactly. So we have, whenever a client comes in for a regular estate planning, which would include a will and a power of attorney, we always have our clients execute living wills and um, most of the clients are happy about that, but if you truly don't care whether the plug is pulled or whether you're, you know, whether somebody else makes that decision for you, then there's no requirement that you execute a living will, but it certainly um, is important if you want to make a medical right. decision for yourself and you're not gonna be able to make that decision at the time. Okay, so if you don't have a living will and, you, and, and you're in that hospital bed, and uh, let's say the doctors say that you, you're brain dead. Uh, uh, if you don't have a living will, uh, who gets to decide whether or not to pull the plug or keep you on life support for an indefinite period of time? Well, the law is very specific about the order of who would make that decision, and obviously the first person in line would be yourself if you're able to make the decision, but we're talking about a situation where you won't be able to. Um, so a, That means if you're the patient, and right, you're incapacitated exactly. in bed and, and you're, you, you've had a, maybe a terrible brain injury or the cancer or whatever it is that got you in that bed, right. you can't make this right. decision. Right, so you can't make this decision. So the next person in line would be your curator if you've been interdicted or your tutor. All right, so let's say that in plain English. <laughs> sure. So if you've had somebody appointed by the court to make decisions on your behalf, 
then that person would be considered your curator okay. and, and that person would make the decision. And then the next person in line, if, if you haven't been interdicted and mm -hmm. you don't have a curator, would be somebody who you've named in a medical power of attorney to make that decision for you. And if you haven't done a medical power of attorney to make those decisions, the, uh -huh. the next person is your spouse. But I think what's interesting about that is that if you do name somebody in a medical power of attorney, that person trumps your spouse. And then if you don't have a spouse, then, then the next person in line would be an adult child or children. You could name your spouse in a medical power of attorney? You could name <coughs> your spouse in a medical power of attorney. You could name a close friend. You could name your accountant. You could name your lawyer. You could name a physician. You can really name anyone who you want to. Okay. At what age should anyone think about, let's say you have a, an opinion and you really want uh, all life-saving measures to carry on even if the doctors say, we don't think there's much of a prayer here, or you have the opposite opinion, please don't, don't uh, run up huge medical bills and carry on for weeks or months while I'm in a coma, pull the plug, whatever your opinion is, at what point in your life should you, if you wanna have a living will, uh, think about getting that living will. You should do this at any point in your life, now, tomorrow, next week. Th there really isn't, it's, it's never too early to have a living will. Um, even if you're not old and sick, you can always <coughs> be in a really bad accident where um, you know a decision would need to be made. And th the state of Louisiana has actually recognized this across the board. Um, if you look at the back of your driver's license, there's a little box that you can check that states whether you have a living will or not. Um, and also when you go to get a driver's license, you can let them know and, and they can put it on your license for you. Now, um, some people uh, might say, well that all sounds fine and dandy, but I already have a will and I put some stuff in my last will and testament. What's the difference between a living will and what, what people call their last will and testament? Right, so this is a question that we get a lot because um, I think the terminology is very confusing because they both have the word will in them. Uh -huh. um, the living will is what it says. It applies when you're alive, even if you're in a coma or you're in a, a permanent vegetative state, you're still, your heart's still beating, you're still alive. And so that's when the living will applies. Your last will and testament doesn't apply till after you've passed away. And so there's really no overlap between those two documents. Okay. So living will is what you want done with you regarding life-saving measures or uh, does it apply to resuscitation measures like if you've had a heart attack and, and you want them to try and bring you back to life? Right, so that's kind of an interesting question and um, we, we can put a living will on the screen but with uh, bringing back to life after a, uh, after a heart attack, uh -huh. um, it's interesting because if a paramedic comes, if, if you have a heart attack and an ambulance comes, then um, unless you have a do not resuscitate bracelet on, which I, I don't think is, is very common, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the paramedics have to give you CPR. Um, okay. But if you're in the hospital, if you're bed in the if you're, you're in the hospital bed and you have a heart attack and you're sick and right. and you have a heart attack, then um, and and you know you sign this living will and you're very clear that that you don't want to be resuscitated, you don't want to be hooked up to a machine, and and there is an option in the living will for whether you want nutrition or hydration or whether you don't want nutrition and hi and hydration. So that's really the only part of the living will where you get to make and a again, decision. Just to make sure we're being as clear as we can, nutrition is being fed even if you're being fed through a tube because you might not be able to chew food safely without choking or hydration that's fluids even if it goes intravenously uh, through your veins. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, but with the living will you can also, um, it, the way that the statute reads is that two physicians and one of those physicians would be your attending physician who's responsible for your medical care have to determine that um, your your condition is irreversible and incurable, and so it's a medical analysis that they make. This isn't you know this this isn't something that your kid decides or your spouse decides. This is a, this is a medical opinion before this living will even goes right. into effect. And 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 you bring up a really good point. Um, a living will doesn't give you the permission to ask for assisted suicide or euthanasia. Uh, that's that's not an option on the on the things you could put in your living will, correct? Right. So Louisiana does not recognize euthanasia, suicide, um, any physician-assisted suicide at all, and the law is really clear that um, that's not something that's permissible 
in the state of Louisiana. And so this isn't a suicide document. Um, and I think that that is confusing to some people. This, this is a document that applies when doctors have, two doctors have decided that you're not gonna wake up again. Um, what other sorts of decisions can you uh, put in a living will or de decisions you wanna have respected in your living will? Are there any other categories or um, important decisions that can be addressed in a living will? Well, th there is one decision. You can really toss it to somebody else. You can say that um, I want my spouse to decide whether or not to pull the plug on me. And so that's something, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. type of living will that you can have where you don't make the decision for yourself, but you name somebody else to make that decision for you. Um, you can add a paragraph in the living will that, that um, your, it, there's a medical terminology for it, but that I believe your brain doesn't have any activity for 45 minutes. Right. Um, and so those are the types of decisions that can be okay. um, added to the language of the living will. <clears throat> now you mentioned that people can create living wills just by having, by, by putting down wishes and having two witnesses sign it. Um, at the Sessions firm, that's, that's not what happens. You don't put them in a room with a piece of paper and two strangers that are not gonna inherit in, from their estate. There are uh, ways of doing living wills that are more legally sound or more legally enforceable. And then there are people who try to do living, will, living wills because they found something on the internet that might be more risk or risky. Well, the best thing that you can possibly do is to make your wishes clear to close relatives or friends. And um, we do, at our firm, we do use a form that's in the statute. Um, it is available, it's, it's readily available online. I was just looking over some websites yesterday and it's really easy to find. Um, you just have to be really careful that you know, you're, you're getting the proper witnesses. But um, if for some reason you aren't able to get the... Yeah, we have the form up on the screen. We okay, keep, great. Keep going. So if there's some reason you aren't able to get the form, and that is the case if you're in an accident, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you can still speak or gesture, then um, you can still make your wishes known before two witnesses, whether it's verbal or nonverbal. Um, and so that's good enough also, okay. but uh, it's, it's much better to have the, stat the form from the statute. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna talk more about this, but uh, that's all the time we have in this segment. Uh, coming up next, we will continue the discussion with Rose Scher about living wills, and we'll also get to some viewer questions. Welcome back to the show. We're continuing our discussion with Rose Share about living wills. Let's get back to the discussion and answer some viewer questions. Now, before I get to the viewer questions, generally speaking, if someone wants to um, find um, the, what we have in our Louisiana statutes, the law, an example of a proper living will, they can not find that online, you said, correct? Yes. Now, okay. I don't have any websites off the top of my head to give viewers, mm -hmm. and you can obviously come to my firm and we'll make sure that you have the right form, but it's, it's easy to find on the internet, um, and I think that's pretty widespread. And we'll find it, we'll put it on the, um, the John Redmond POA.com law great. firm site as well. Um, so either through the Sessions firm or uh, calling the John Redmond sure. law firm or the, the POA, the JRPOA.com or John Redmond POA.com, we'll find it on there. Um, generally, is there a charge if someone wants to be double sure that they uh, that they have a good, uh, a legally appropriate living will drawn up for them? What can one expect to pay uh, a respectable law firm for this service? Well, we generally do it as a part of our other services, mm -hmm. and at my firm we bill by the hour, and so the partners have an hourly rate mm -hmm. of depending on what level they're at, they could be over $300 okay. an hour. And then we've got associates who have lower hour, hourly rates and paralegals who have even lower hourly sure, rates. Sure. Um, with the living will, it, it's really just a form. So um, if, if we have a new client who's coming in for estate planning, it's kind of like land yacht. Sure. Um, if somebody's just coming in for the living will and they want to sit down and have a conversation, we would, we would bill by the hour okay. for that. And, and frankly, um, 
you might be able to do a living will on it and then ask uh, and call the firm and say, what would you charge me? And then if you think it's reasonable, go in and see that lawyer. Exactly. Let's get to the viewer questions. Um, first viewer question asks, uh, how can a living will be changed? After you've created one, can you change it and how so? Sure, so I'm gonna answer this question a few different ways. The first thing that I want us to talk about is, um, and this is, this is a little bit of an aside, but the most important thing about the living will is that it can be accessed and somebody can find it. So you can go to all this trouble to have a living will, and this applies to other estate planning documents, and then nobody knows that you have it and um, or nobody can find it. So, so it doesn't do anybody any good, it no good if it can't be found anywhere. So how can we make sure that we can find these documents? If you come to a law firm, you know, the, the law firm will, will keep an original of it. Um, if you've got a spouse, kids, parents, you can, you can always give um, a, an original to one of them. So um, when, you, when you create it originally, you can sign multiple originals. Right, you have can create multiple, multiple, originals. multiple originals. We can do certified copies. Um, like, I think multiple originals would be the best idea there. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing is, is this is kind of neat, you can actually store it in the Louisiana Secretary of State's registry. And it's $20, um, they'll accept an, a multiple original or an original, and they'll send you back a laminated card that you can keep in your wallet that says that you've got your living will stored in the Louisiana Secretary of State's registry. Um, and sometimes they'll send you a do not resuscitate bracelet if you request that. Um, and the list of people who have their wills in the registry at the Secretary of State's office is actually public and it's on the website. Um, so if you send yours in, you can check and see that you've got your, okay. your, um, your living will register there. And so what I'm gonna, now I'm gonna get into changing your living will. So if you do have your living will registered with the Secretary of State's office, it makes it a little bit more difficult to change it. Um, and the way that you change a living will in general is you can revoke it, you can physically rip it up, mm -hmm. um, you can, uh, you can uh, make a writing that says that you're revoking it, um, and so basically j destroying it and doing a new one would probably be the best way to change it. Um, but you just need to make sure that all the people who have your living will know that you've changed it or you've destroyed it. Right. And um, with the Secretary of State's registry, you send them a letter and a, I think a fee of $5 to, to get them to uh, either remove what they have and replace it with something else or to completely remove it. Okay. And, but like you said, make sure that your family and friends and those people who would be uh, involved and around you, it, God forbid you're in that difficult situation, they know that there exists a living will and your wishes uh, are in that living will. How you Right, want to and also, I mean, the best person to have your living will would be your doctor. Um, if you see doctors at Ochsner, then you wanna make sure that Ochsner has it Oh, on that's file a good, that's a good point. Um, in their database. And so uh, that brings me to something else, the law post, which is Louisiana Physician's Order for Scope of Treatment. And um, it's not a living will per se, mm -hmm. but there's now a uniform form throughout the state of Louisiana. And um, it's something that your doctor fills out and it's really only something that your doctor will fill out when, you, when you've got about six months left to live. Mm -hmm. um, your doctor signs it and you sign it and that can sort of act as, as a um, wish for what happens Do when you you're- Do you need to ask your doctor about that form or he'll, he should automatically or she should automatically be asking the patient uh, to fill out the form when, when you've got this? terminal diagnosis? That's a really good question. Um, I haven't heard from clients one way or, or the other, but um, I think that it's in the doctor's best okay. interest to have this information on hand, um, just because and, you know, it makes it a lot easier yeah. for the doctor. Well, and certainly patients can ask their doctors if, they, right. if they're in that situation. Now, um, a very interesting um, question uh, came up, and it reminded me of this uh, Terry uh, Schiavo case. Um, what happened to uh, Shabo? Um, what happens if someone ha has been in a bad accident and it's a lady and she is uh, pregnant? What happens um, to her living will wishes if she has a living will, either to pull the plug or not? What what happens in that situation? Well, this is a really interesting new area of the law. Um, there was a case in Texas last year 
and um, a woman was 33 years old and she was uh, she was pregnant um, and she collapsed I think she had a blood clot um, and then uh, it took about an hour for her husband to find her and at that point her brain had been without oxygen for a long period of time and the baby's brain had been without oxygen so there was no way she was going to survive so she was hooked up to life support and she had been very clear with her husband that, that she didn't want to be living on a machine and, and, and she wanted the, the plug pulled. And he knew that, but um, uh, under Texas law, they wanted to keep this woman uh, hooked up to life support because she was pregnant and they couldn't pull a plug on, on a and, fetus. And we talked about this before, she was about 14 weeks pregnant at the time of the... the uh, I think so, she, mm -hmm. she, was, she was 14 weeks pregnant. So. Um, it, Anyway, the, um, she was examined by a, an obstetrician and it was determined that the fetus was not really going to be viable and that the, there wasn't going to be a live baby born, mm -hmm. a live healthy baby born. And so ultimately, um, her husband was able to pull the plug on her. So in response to what happened in Texas, we've got a, a new provision in our law in Louisiana that says that um, if you're 20 weeks pregnant, and even if you have a living will and you've made it really clear that you, you, that you don't want to be on life support, um, if you're examined by an obstetrician and it, it, your fetus could be born a live baby, then uh, the plug is not getting pulled on you. So um, for any woman who is potentially going to be pregnant at some point and feel strongly about not being on life support, you really want to add a special provision in your living will that says, even if I'm pregnant, you know, I, I want the plug pulled. <clears throat> and that's uh, that's a law that literally just went into effect this year, just in the last few months. June 23rd, 2014. So this okay. this is very, very new. Um, okay. I don't think that there have been any cases in the state of Louisiana on this issue, um, but that's just sort of something else that you want to think about yeah. when you're thinking about your living will. Okay. Um, fascinating discussion. Um, one viewer question asked, um, are there arguments against having a living will? If so, what are the arguments against uh, having a living will? Well, I think one of the strongest arguments against having a living will is just that there's no flexibility after, you, after you've checked the box for nutrition and hydration or not having nutrition and hydration and signed your living will, then that's it. And um, so a lot of times it's good to have somebody else make that decision because, you know, I, I can't give a medical opinion, but I believe that there's times when, you know, maybe there is a little bit of hope, or maybe you're, maybe there's a reason to be optimistic, e even if the doctors have said there isn't. And um, if you, if you have your living will and everything signed, sealed, delivered, then then you're getting pulled off of the plug. Your, the plug is getting pulled on you. So um, it it could be good instead of having a living will to name someone to make that decision for you. Once you uh, go to the trouble of creating a living will, when does it take effect? The living will takes effect as soon as it's signed by the witnesses and you've signed it. Okay. Um, and uh, in order to, it's in effect, but you've got to show it to the medical providers, your, caring, your attending physician. Exactly. Right? So if you have a living will and you keep it locked up in your, in your safety deposit box, then, and you don't tell anybody about it, then, you know, there's really no reason to have one. Okay. It, it's, it's great to, um, to, to give it to your doctors and your family members. Okay. Um, does the living will expire? Um, you know, not that I know of. Um, and that's an interesting question because the law has changed a little bit. We, we changed it a few years ago to allow the nutrition and hydration selections. And so um, if you have an older living will, you might want to get it updated, but it's not going to be invalidated. Um, it's an expression of a person's wish. And so it's something that um, doctors would really give deference to over over anything else, and, and so it's it's not going to be invalidated and, and expired. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time, so let's see if we can sum this up. Uh, um, living wills. Uh, if you were trying to explain it to a class of fifth graders or high school students, why are living wills important, and uh, should uh, uh, should people uh, have it on their list of important legal documents to have 
and why? Well, they're very important if you have a strong opinion about whether you want to remain on life support, but even if you don't, they're important because um, if you don't have one, then somebody else is going to have to make that decision, and that could be a really tough decision, and um, it can cause a lot of discord between family members. So it, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have with your family members, but it's better to make your wishes known and to have a living will. Okay. Well, there's so much more to cover, but unfortunately we're all out of time. We'll be continuing our discussion about estate planning and important legal documents with Rocher on our next episode. Remember, you can learn all about everything we talked about on today's show by visiting our website, johnredmondpoa.com. You can also watch every episode of the show and submit your legal questions that we'll try to answer on the air. Thanks to our guest, Rose Scher. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll see you next time on John Redmond, Power of Attorney.